Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and this is going to be added to the series on Strength of Materials. Now, I left off Strength of Materials, I think I was going through some basic concepts like Poisson's Ratio, you know, and Stress and Strain, and Modules of Elasticity. I'm going to continue at this point, uh, and probably go through this series uh, for the summer, uh, and it's going to be covering things like Axial Loading. Now, axial loading is one of the more interesting topics. I know it's, you know, strength of materials and it sounds odd to have a favorite part of strength of materials, but one of the things I like about axial loading is it actually covers some topics that can be fairly complicated, but also have a, a very simple application. You know, axial loading is, is very straightforward. Literally, it's straightforward right off the axis of the part. And in this particular uh, application, we're going to be going over uh, linear displacement or the displacement of a member. Now why is this important? Why is this specific topic important? It's because axial loading takes place in so many ways and it is such a crucial part of, of a design. You know, it's, it can give you some idea of whether or not a member is going to be low, if a member is actually going to get loaded in, in axially, you know, it can give you some idea as to how it's going to deform, how it's going to react under that particular load, particularly mechanical load. You know, not only does it let you know when something's going to fail, but if it's going to fall out of specification, if it's going to stretch or deform, linearly deform or be compressed so much that it actually will affect the function of the, the design that you're actually trying to create, you know, whatever it is you're trying to, trying to make. Now, it's not just mechanical displacement that I want you to focus on today. There's also applications such as this railroad track where uh, there was actually no mechanical load that caused this this circumstance. This is purely based on the fact that something was not designed correctly and there was a temperature influence that caused those railroad ties to actually buckle. So there's two types of mechanical loads that we're going to be going over today, or two types of loads we're going to go over. And one is mechanical, you know, what you say, the bolts on the right, and the other one is uh, thermal. So we're going to be looking at uh, thermal loads as well as mechanical loads, how they impact a member axially, as well as how you can, what type of information, what calculations you can do as a way of helping, helping you to uh, perfect your design, you know, improve your design, to be able to predict and avoid circumstances like this. So we can define axial loading. So axial loading, it occurs when an object is loaded so that the force is normal to the axis that is fixed. You know, very straightforward definition. So we can look at this visually. You know, we've got you know two different members, one that's actually fixed, one that's actually just you know a free body diagram of the one that's fixed. You know, and it's the object is loaded so that the force is normal. So this is the force P, and it's going to be normal to the axis that is fixed. So actually, it's, so there, that's what we're looking at here. So we've got, you know, it's going right along the axis of the member. So it's axially loaded. Now, a couple of things we're going to go through with axial loading is the two things is one is displacement, linear displacement. You put that load onto a member and there will be some form of, of displacement. And another thing I want to go through in another video maybe the next video after this one is the principle of superposition now I won't cover that in this video because it is you know not as intuitive right off the bat it's a good concept just for us video of its own it's also more applicable to more complicated uh, setups so in this video we're just going to be talking about the linear displacement of something that's being actually loaded so mechanical linear displacement like I said there's two different types there's mechanical, you know, where there's actually a, a load, physically load put input on, and then there's thermal. And this first one we're going to go over is the mechanical displacement. So here we have our member, you know, in the free body diagram, and it has a load P, you know, and if you put a load on a member, you will see some level of displacement. And all the displacement means is that you have a change in length, you know, and change in length our delta length and it is covered by this lowercase delta Greek symbol delta for change and that is just a symbol that lets you know when you're dealing with a linear displacement or a displacement in general now there's a few things that go on 
as we went through some past videos as far as what linear displacement or putting a load onto a member does beyond just linear displacement. One of the things, the most basic things in strength of materials is you will actually have a stress. So a material under load will have a stress and that stress will be based directly on the load and the area of the material, the cross-sectional area of the material. So that's one, one characteristic of a material that is under load. Another one is a strain, which is just the change in length over the original length or a percentage of change, you know, change in length over the original length of the object that L sub O is the original length. And then there's something else to take into account, which is the ratio of the stress and strain, which is the modulus of elasticity. You know, the amount of, you can think of that as how much that object, how much stress needs to be put onto the object in order to get it to actually change its length. You know, so you've got these, I want you to keep these three concepts in mind. You put a load onto a material, you will have a stress, you will have a strain, and this is a function of its modulus of elasticity, which is a function of the material. So steel will have a different modulus of elasticity than brass, which will be different than copper, which will be different than aluminum. You know, so all metals have a modulus of elasticity that is just a function, a very predictable linear relationship between stress and strain. So keep that, that in mind as we move forward. And this all ties back, and I'll show you how this all ties back to, to the uh, linear displacement. So we've got our three concepts here. We've got stress, we've got strain, and we've got modulus of elasticity. And we've got our member with a load on the end. So as this load is on the end, it's going to do a certain amount of stress. It's got a certain amount of, of strain that's taken place, which is just the chain length versus the change in length. And we've got a modulus of elasticity, which is a function of that material, whatever it happens to be. Now, there is a way and a reason that for this next thing I'm going to show you. Uh, if you're designing something, there are certain things that you are going to know and then there are certain things that you're just not going to know and that you're going to try and find out. And one of those things that you can look up in any textbook or materials book is what the modulus of elasticity is. Like I said, there's a different one for aluminum than for steel than for brass, so it's a function of the material. If you're designing a member, you're going to know what kind of load it's under. You're probably going to have an idea as to what the length is, as well as what the area is. So you will know the geometry that's going to be required for your, your object to function. What you don't know is under that specific load, how much you can expect this thing to move. How much you expect this thing to have a, of a displacement. So what we can do is we can have this equation, or we can find this equation that can help get us there. You know, since we know it's a function of the material, you know, the modulus of elasticity is a function of the material, we can make a decision on what material we want to use. And we can say that it takes a certain amount of stress and strain. What we can do is we can solve this for strain. And then once we've solved it for strain, we know that strain is a function of our deformation over its original length, which is what we're ultimately looking for. And as you multiply both sides by your original length, you solved it for the strain. Now, we do have, you know, modulus of elasticity, which we can get from a textbook, you know, or a catalog on materials. Our, our design is going to let us know what length we're looking for. Now, the stress, we could break this down a little bit more. Remember, stress is just load over area, you know, so we have a design load and we have an area that corresponds with the length the original length that we're looking for. So we can make this equation a little more useful by just identifying it as force over area. So if we want to find out what the displacement of a material is, you know, we can use this equation here where the displacement, mechanical displacement, is a function of the load times the original length, load is defined by N, divided by the area and the modulus of elasticity for the material that we're selecting. And that is an equation that we use to figure out what the displacement will be under particular load for an object. Now let's use this in an example. So we have a two inch diameter, 24 inch long bar made of A36 steel. All right, so we, we know the, the diameter of the bar we're gonna have in this particular device. We know how long it's going to be, it's 24 inches. We know the material. And we also know what the load is. It has a load of 1,000 
kip, 1,000 kilopounds of axial load. So we want to find out what the deformation is. All right, so this is what we're given. This is what I normally tell my students to set up a problem. You're given the diameter in two, two inches. You're given the length, 24 inches. You're given your load, you know, 1,000 times 10 to the third pounds. And we have an modulus of elasticity that is specific to A36 steel. It's totally dependent. If we had changes to aluminum or brass, that modulus of elasticity would change, which would change the whole outcome of how much this is going to deform. So what we're trying to find is the deformation delta. Uh, so we'll just apply this particular equation. But before we do this, we have to find out the area of the bar. We have the load, we have the length, we have the modulus of elasticity. We don't have the area, so we have to find the area of the bar based on the diameter. And that simple surround bar, the area is pi over 4 times d squared. Diameter is 2 inches. So pi over 4 times 2 squared is just 4, you know, which comes out to 3.14 inches squared. So now we can figure out, based on what we have, how much this object is going to deform, how much it's going to actually extend in length based on that load. So we apply it to our equation, our deformation, and what we find out is it's going to come out to a little more than a quarter of an inch, 0.264 inches, so 1,000 pounds times 10 to the third times 24 inches and then we got our modulus of elasticity which is 29 times 10 to the six pounds per square inch you know it's it's six because 10 to the third ksi here we got 10 you know 10 to the third times 10 to the third 10 to the six and we figured out the area 3.14 square inches and just for your edification keep in mind the units do check out the inches squared cancel, the pounds cancel, and you're left with inches. So we, it does make sense that this is a linear displacement. So 0 0.264 inches. Now, there's also a thermal displacement. Now this is just as big of an issue. This has actually happened on a train track. The way this happened was during some routine repair, they had to go out and remove some of the ties that were damaged and they replaced it with new material. Now the problem was it was replaced under certain circumstances, you know, weather conditions, and no one took the time or improperly, you know, to figure out how much material to use, how long the tie should have been to put in place to take into account the change in temperature and, and furthermore how much that tie was going to expand. So what happened with that miscalculation, you wound up with a tie that buckled, you know, when the weather warmed up. So essentially what you had here was a length of tie that was put into place. Uh, the heat, or some heat was applied, the ch temperature changed. And, you know, as you probably guess, the temperature, or excuse me, the material actually changed in length. So we had another delta T. You know, in this case, it was a thermally influenced delta T. So this is based around thermal loading. Now, keep in mind what we said here. We have the original length of the material. You know, so this is a function of the original length of the material, however long that tie was. You know, if this had been a much shorter tie, you wouldn't have had it quite as dramatic. And if it had been a longer tie, then you would have seen this buckling even more dramatic because the expansion would have changed. We also had a change in temperature. And we also had a material. So it, again, there was this whole function, this whole thing was a function of a very specific material. When you put it this way, you look at the equation, that change in or that change in displacement, or displacement thermal under thermal load, or delta L, is a function of alpha times delta T. Delta T is just the change in temperature times the original length. And alpha is just the coefficient of thermal expansion, which is a function of the material. Again, just like with modulus of elasticity, if this had been aluminum, if this had been brass, if this had been copper or steel, we would have seen a completely different displacement because they all have a unique alpha, just like they all have a unique modulus of elasticity. So let's look at a brief example of this. So we have an A36 steel bar, and we've got an initial temperature of 60 degrees, and the temperature is raised to 120. Determine the average normal should be displacement, not stress, developed in the bar. 
So we have a, again, a two foot bar and we've got a temperature change from 60 to 120 and when it's made out of A3060. So again, looking at your, your handbook for A36 steel and everything that we were given, we have two foot length, We've got a coefficient of thermal expansion of 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 6 per degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the unit it is per degrees Fahrenheit. And we've got an initial and a final temperature of 120 degrees. So we can find the thermal displacement. So again, we have our initial equation of thermal displacement, which was alpha times the change in temperature times the length. And we can figure out what that change of length is, which is just 60 degrees. So now we can apply it to our equation. Our alpha, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 6 per degrees Fahrenheit, times the change in temperature, which is 60 degrees, and the original length, 2 feet, which is just 24 inches. So 2 feet, you know, 12 inches per foot, just 24 inches. And our units again, check out per degrees Fahrenheit times degrees Fahrenheit cancel and we're ended with inches which is a displacement and that comes out to 0 0.0095 inches or 9.5 times 10 to the negative third inches so that is a couple of examples for linear displacement one is mechanical one was thermal and in our next video we're going to have uh, the principle of superposition so I hope to see you then, otherwise thanks for watching.